Good morning, everyone. We are now live. Uh, welcome to a very special episode of the James Loud Show, which even I didn't know about until late last night. Uh, welcome, everybody. And here is the magical Mr. James Loud. Hey, guys. How you doing? Thanks for tuning uh, in this week. Sorry, uh, we've missed a couple weeks. I'm waiting for my studio to get finished. We're having some technical difficulties with uh, sound dampening. So that it sounds good. We got all the Joe Rogan experience equipment, and uh, it's going to be really cool once it's it's ready. But uh, until then, we're going to continue doing it from my office. So uh, yeah, I just I want to give a shout out to uh, Mr. Uh, Bud Kilowatt who sent me a beautiful poster, which I'll try to grab in a little bit and show you guys to add to the collection on the wall. Um, and then today we have a special guest, one of my good friends and uh, great breeder, Rick Mosca. Hey there, James. Peter. How's it going? Yeah, going really well. Keeping busy here on the farm in uh, northern Illinois, getting, uh, awesome. getting a lot of seeds together. So, yeah, yeah, it's going good. Cool, man. So, you know, how's the weather out there? Is it, is it you know, I know Chicago's all over the place and Illinois is all over the place weather-wise. How's it right now? Yeah, you know what? Uh, actually, great. It's going to be in the 70s today low 70s, and then we're pushing 80s by midweek, and uh, soon to be 90s again. So, awesome. Midwest for you. Yeah, so you've been all over the place lately with shows and stuff starting to happen again. You want to tell us a little bit about the shows uh, that you've been able to go to? Yeah, we'd love to, Jay's. But before we start, I just want to give a big shout out to all the servicemen and women out there who have really uh, donated and really sacrificed for our country um and uh helped us get our freedoms and liberties and i think we're all a part of that so thank you to, to all of them on this memorial day weekend yeah for coming on the show I, I agreed man it's just we wouldn't be here today without the you know the the select few that have gone out and whether they were drafted or whether they decided to join the military you know uh i, I think those people you can't speak highly enough about what they've done for us and our freedom. So excellent. But yeah, so Illinois shows, let's talk about some shows. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a lot of shows uh, now starting to pop back up. We're getting notified about a bunch of them. There was a real big one uh, just a couple of days ago, Canacon down in Oklahoma city, which is always a really great show. Um, we were supposed to be a part of that but not knowing whether or not uh, where we would be as a country with COVID. We didn't want to take any chances, so uh, we opted out of it. Uh, but I hear that it was a really terrific show. A lot of people, um, you know, near uh, to the levels of last the last time they had these shows uh, two years ago. But uh, so for that, we're really, really excited. Um, there's uh, some other ones that are going to be coming. Uh, to the Midwest, uh, Indo Expo, uh, Canacon as well. Uh, I know Nikan's coming out here too. And so, um, you know, those would be really great shows, usually very well attended, especially since a lot of the, uh, the larger cultivation corporations are uh, headquartered in Chicago. And so, you know, we expect to see a lot of them. Uh, at these shows uh, for a lot of the education portion of them. But uh, no, they're uh, looks like they're going to be back up and running. So Awesome. Yeah, exciting times, man. I feel like the, we're seeing the end of the pandemic or uh, what, whatever you want to call it. But uh, yeah, I feel like that it's great that we're getting towards the end of it and people are taking their masks off. And I think you know, getting back to normal is as normal as could be. I mean, our industry, we've been blessed to have an industry that thrives under the pandemic that will continue to thrive after the pandemic. Um, so, yeah, I, I see some comments about your raspberry boogie. People love the raspberry boogie. You want to tell everybody about the raspberry boogie? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, raspberry boogie uh, is uh, a strain that has really come into its own. Uh, it's our best-selling strain. Uh, we will have a feminized version, uh, God willing, uh, in the fall. And, um, you know, what makes it special is not only, uh, um, you know, the THC, but uh, the CBD. So the, the overall 
terpene profile of the plant. Raspberry is rather unique uh, in uh, cannabis uh, genetics. Uh, we don't really see a lot of it, uh, but people really seem to like the, the flavors, the terpenes, uh, the coloration, very fast maturing plant. Um, it'll be done outdoors uh, by the end of September, usually around the 27th, 28th. Uh, I bred it for indoor use, but it has excelled outdoors because of the early finishing. And so to be able to go in and pull a plant um, by the end of September is, you know, you're avoiding all of the frost, um, you know, the extreme temperatures that are just around the corner. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a really strong grower, um, your favorite food for a lot of people. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely have it back on the menu. Awesome. Yeah, I think it's a crowd pleaser for sure. I, 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 you get a lot of people talking about it, and it's an awesome strain. Um, so as far as indoor, does it finish around 63 days, 55 days? What are we looking at? Actually, a little bit. It's, uh, it's uh, right around 50, 52 days. It's That's very awesome. quick. And, uh, yeah, right now we're doing selections of um, F2s and F3s. Um, we have some really, really fine uh, moms that we've kind of narrowed down to. So we're evaluating about a dozen different moms right now. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to see consistency uh, amongst, um, you know, the plants because it's going to make it rather challenging to select, you know, the, the, the favorite, or one, two, or three. Uh, but that's generally what we'll do after uh, a dozen one and get it down to three and then we'll grow those out a couple times and then figure out which one we'd like best breed that and, uh, and get seeds. So Nice. Yeah, so I want to on something that uh, somebody mentioned on uh, the Instagram feed the other day about feminized seed being easy to pheno hunt and, you know, as opposed to regular seeds. And in, in my experience, you know, it's like finding winners is, is very dependent. You know, it depends on who you are, what you feel as a winner. A lot of times there'll be stuff in a 10 pack that's good enough for most people, I think. But if you want to find that unicorn, which is like what we call those winners that are like the, the OG Kush, when somebody found the OG Kush or when somebody found the, the Sunset Sherbert, when Sherbinsky and, and Cookies, when they found that Sunset Sherbert or GMO, that real Fino, that one. Those are unicorns. Like even with feminized seeds, you don't find unicorns that often. It's it's a rarity. And even in a hundred pack, you might find a, a keeper, but does that keeper translate to a unicorn? Not necessarily. Now, the advantage of breeding feminized seeds as opposed to regular seeds is you know what the male or the donor, which is not necessarily male, but reversed female is going to express to a degree. That doesn't always translate, but a lot of times you have a better insight of what it's going to do so there are advantages that way, but as far as, you know, what's your take on that, Rick? I totally agree. Uh, you know what the, uh, the mom is uh, donating, uh, especially in the S1, because you see the mother and then you see the, the reverse female that is the mother, but just, you know, donating the uh, pollen or the extra set of chromosomes. Um, and... Uh, you know, I think that it really adds a lot to um, stabilizing and, uh, you know, getting towards an inbred selection um, of uh, female uh, seeds, true female seeds. Um, and, uh, no, it, it's great to, to work with, you know, those females that are um, very stable uh, because those tend to be the, the better donors for pollen and and uh, making S1s and uh, feminized uh, uh, crosses. And, um, you know, those, those have really worked well for us, especially like when we did the, um, I did the uh, Legend OG uh, feminized, uh, got that from a very, very good friend out of the East Coast to rename, remain uh, nameless, but uh, he knows who he is. And he's, uh, that, I mean, that was just a phenomenal um donor female because she was so stable um and just uh, really added a lot of punch and some of my strongest strains were from her crosses 
uh, like I hit up the uh, East Coast Sour Diesel with her pylon, and that tested at almost 32% THC. I mean, it's just, I know it's the overall terpene profile, but when you have THC that, that's that high, you know, that's, uh, that's I think, a success. And uh, actually, there was a grower who had tested out on the East Coast who um, brought me some flour at the Boston Freedom Rally about uh, three, four years ago. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's always great to see um, and uh, sample some of the uh, the growers' uh, favorite favorite flowers. So especially when they're ours. <laughs> One of the best feelings is when you get people. That, you know, I, I actually like when when I've given seeds away for prizes and uh, you know with with trivia or whatever or auctions and stuff like that. When you see those people coming back, where they actually grew the flower out and they have samples and they show you at a show. Emerald Emerald uh, Cup is a great place for that. It seems like I get a lot of people coming coming to me with some flower that some of the stuff is like years old where it's like I had those genetics years ago that I haven't even thought about them in a long time. And it's, it's really a great thing when you see people coming through with flower. You know, in this day and age where people are collecting seeds like Pokemon rather than sprouting them, which I would much prefer the germination and then collecting the mothers but uh, a lot of people love collecting seeds it's just amazing yeah um not only um you know the flowers that they've grown but then also what they've crossed out to because they'll take you know a favorite male or a female reverser and hit it up with you know one of my strains and that's like that's really cool because i love to see people experimenting and doing it on their own so they can be self-sufficient um, because at the end of the day, you know, if they're happy and, they, and they've grown out some, uh, some good flower, uh, then, you know, that's uh, very satisfying as a breeder. Totally. I, I think it's kind of funny. I've had a whole seed companies base their entire line on one of my males, which, you know, people, once you sell it, people can do that. In my opinion, do whatever you want to do. I think it's a little bit silly to, to do a whole lot. I think people should do more breeding. I feel like, there are breeders. We're doing real breeding work where I'm back crossing. I'm inbreeding. I'm trying to do good selections and then take those selections and make more great things. But I'm also doing F1 breeding where I'm using other people's, you know, donors and reversing them. But, uh, you know, I think more work needs to be done on the breeding side. So if you're starting a seed company, the best approach is to actually take and do some work, get a donor or a male and put that on something that you call yours. And that really will, you know, that'll separate you as a breeder as opposed to just a seed producer, with 90% of the people are just seed producers out there. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really true. And, um, you know, putting the work in and keeping the generations alive so you can go back and uh, work them and rework them uh, to improve the plants. Um, because at the end of the day, that, I mean, that's, that's what we should be doing. Uh, and like Rob Clark says, is to use more land races. It's uh, good to see that there's some uh, uh, good land races from like the Indian Land Race Company. Uh, they've uh, they've sent some uh, really really nice um, different types of plants uh, or seeds um, for for uh, future breeding. So that's uh, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. I think you know. Instead of just creating, a, you know, I wish people would have, you know, we get excited about gelatos and we get excited about, before it was OG chems and the gas and gas got put in everything. And then it was cookies for a while and sherbet and then now gelatos. And I wish people got more excited about the land race stuff and some of those unique, you know, diversity, really diversity. And, and that's what I like about your genetics. I feel like you kind of go for those diverse things. You're not just shooting for the same thing everybody else has. You're really kind of trying to separate yourself in that regard. Plus your funeral. So. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's uh, really, that's part of the beauty. There's so much to choose from. You know, um, I think, you know, we need to uh, kind of go in the direction that uh, we see is, is best, you know, because part of it, of breeding, as you know, is uh, – not only the scientific part of it, but also the artistic part of it. And I think that's what helps influence, you know, my selections and, you know, what direction I go, because I don't want to be like everybody else. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we have to uh, 
be able to survive uh, in this ever changing um, community. Uh, and it's changed tremendously over the past several years. It's built up, it's continued to grow, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of changes happening in the background right now. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's a way that, you know, if you do like land races and you want to incorporate them into modern genetics, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's the beauty of it is genetic diversity, trying to make something new. And it's really difficult to do. I mean, it pretty much everything we're doing is reinventing the wheel on one aspect or another, but that doesn't mean that we found everything. There's just, you know, with the diversity, it's more diverse as far as cannabis is more diverse than any other cultivated plant on the planet. You know, and we still haven't found everything. There's still other things to find, other terpene profiles. You know, it's like, uh, you know, we're, we're exploring those gelatos and finding everything in the gelato on that side with the, the floral characteristics, with the gas. And I think, you know, and then even we were doing that a little bit with the Durban, putting Durban in the, with the cookies and everything, you know, because that, that really is that cherry anise character that, you know, we found in a bunch of stuff moving forward, which is also in the gelato line. But uh, what what is your go-to as far as uh, cultivar right now? What's your um, <clears throat> we're doing evaluations on uh, our planet Hulk, which is uh, the Bruce Banner uh, across the, the Indiana bubblegum. Um, we, uh, we have some really fine examples of, of moms and we've uh, sampled some and uh, we're growing out more right now. So we'll uh, be narrowing down uh, selections for another feminization here shortly. Um, the raspberry boogies, of course, and then also the Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew is uh, rather unique. Um, that's a sour kush cross the pink 2.0, pink bean from uh, Exotic Mike. Um, that one has really been uh, really come back in a strong way because uh, there was a, a picture that was posted by a commercial grower in Southern Oregon. And uh, uh, he's standing next to a tree, a marijuana tree. And that was the, uh, the Mountain Dew Baja Blast. Um, this thing, he could not even reach, you know, the top of the plant, the, the tree. Uh, this thing yielded 13 pounds. Um, and it's all really super high quality. So uh, we're going to work on a uh, feminization of this and probably do some line extensions, uh, do some outcross and, and see what we, we come up with. But uh, yeah, so th those are the ones that we're, we're working on right now. And uh, uh, yeah, excited about all of them. We've seen some really great phenos. We've selected um so we narrowed it down to about uh, another 10 to 12 uh, planet hulk moms and there's one that has really st stood out um just a, a a different type this to me is uh we'll see how she finishes up but she's looking to be a a unicorn just really special um and it does not grow like the other ones and uh really tight nugs so um excited about that one Super excited about that one. Awesome. So, yes, someone in the chat wants me to ask you about your 10-year anniversary varieties and if you could share anything on those. Um, <clears throat> anyone in particular that they're looking for info on? Well, they didn't say anything specific. I'm sure they'll chime in. But yeah, let's oh, the anniversary project. Well, so um, there's uh, – you know, when I started out, James, I did not start out to be a breeder. That was not my intention. Um, I connected with Cinderella 99, you know, from Brothers Grimm. And I just love this thing because it's very cerebral, um, but then had um, a really nice, creative, artistic side to her that, uh, you know, I never wanted to lose that, uh, uh, that feeling. So... Uh, I asked a very good friend of mine, uh, Garrett Slot, who owned Magus Genetics, a very close friend of mine, um, how I would go about um, keeping around by making seeds. And so he walked me through um, how to select a male, um, you know, which mom to keep, which is more obvious, as everybody knows. 
um, and then how to go about breeding them, timing, um, you know, the uh, number of plants, how to keep them healthy and uh, really breed some, uh, some good seed stock. And, um, and so I had all these seeds that I made um, and um, he, uh, Garrett said I should uh, uh, share them with Gypsy. So I sent a bunch over to the Gypsy and he gave them out as freebies off of Seed Bay. And um, a one person in particular, a crazy composer who was senior editor of High Times at the time, um, he, had, uh, he had sent him some because he's really fond of the Cinderella 99, as well as Gypsy, one of their favorite strains. So um, uh, he grew them out, did a blog on it, and he said uh, that it was uh, one of the best examples of Cinderella 99 he's ever uh, grown. And uh, all of a sudden, everybody wanted the seeds at that point. So uh, I became a breeder. And uh, so Cinderella is one of those strains that I've bred for uh, well over 10 years. Um, they still have her and tend to do uh, a release uh, later this year on her too. Um, and, uh, and the other one is the Old Time Moonshine. Old Time Moonshine, uh, originally from DJ Short, as we all know. He only released them for about six months because the line had a lot of mutations in it. And uh, so, you know, it's a derivative of the blueberry line. And um, um, I grew this one out. Money Mike sent me a pack and had another pack donated from someone from IC Mag, um, the, uh, uh, the website, and uh, did selections through those. And uh, came up with uh, uh, what I felt to be the best parents. And um, the male was a, a sativa-leaning male. Very small, but very potent. Um, and um, so, you know, I've kept this uh, cultivar alive. And, and um, up till earlier this year, you know, we had seeds available. Uh, we'll uh, re-release some uh, late this year, early next year. Uh, just because I think people like, you know, those old school strains uh, and one that I'm very fond of and has made some really nice uh, outcrosses, some hybrids, um, but a really great indica, um, leaning uh, plant, great coloration, leathery leaves, great flower, um, terpene profile is very unique. I mean, all, all the above. So, yeah, so those two I think are... Uh, probably the, the most well-known of the 10-year anniversary strains. Awesome. So, yeah, just want to touch on something. DJ Short, I got a lot of respect for uh, DJ Short. We were sitting together in a booth selling seeds years ago, and uh, he gave me a tip that I want to share with you guys. I was so, you know, and this is like 2014, I was so excited about tissue culture. Uh, and he loves giving good tips. And so I said, tissue culture, man, I got to get into tissue culture. Super excited about doing tissue culture on my own, which I'm, I'm, for me, it's not my thing. I have friends that do amazing work with tissue culture, but his tip for tissue culture was, why do you need tissue culture when you can take your mom, get some clones, put those clones in the ground, grow those out and take fresh cuttings. It does the same exact thing. And uh, to a degree, he's correct. You know, and I think for you guys that can't afford tissue culture, using the sun in the ground, he talks about the natural vibrations of the earth reviving. But e regardless of how it works, I would say that putting your, you know, you get vigorous growth, you put stuff in the ground, you, you give it a good diet, and you're going to get some amazing new growth where you can take clones and then you're going to re revigorize your mothers. You know, I think that's a great tip. Uh, stuck with me all these years. And I love tissue culture too. Don't get me wrong. especially. We, we got Joe on here talking about hoplite and virus. We got my friend Justin from DSG, and he does amazing work. Uh, but, you know, when, when there's stuff that you have to clean up with tissue culture, you have to clean it up with tissue culture. But if you're just trying to get some life back into your moms, a great way to do it would be put them in the sun and then get some new cuttings. And uh, it's funny you should say that because uh, uh, just uh, last week we put some uh, plants outside that – um, are healthy, but really need some invigoration. 
you know, putting them outside for at least a month really helps the plants so much, you know, and having not only the vibrations of the earth, but then also uh, some of the extremes uh, that Mother Nature uh, gives the plants with uh, strong winds or, you know, heat or cold nights, you know, that really, I think, uh, uh, breathes a lot of life back into them. Yeah, so I just put a creme rose Skittles that was back crossed on to the Skittles that I really love. I just took one of the moms and put it outside, and it just hates it outside. So it doesn't work with every cultivar. This is a finicky little plant, man, and it just – it's a slow grower. It's just as finicky. It's more finicky than cookies or OG, but I love the turf profile. It's got a rose water with Skittles, and it's just absolutely amazing, but it does not like outside. It, in fact, it hates it, and it's, it's just looking like it's about to die. But for the most part, that works great with every variety. And this is the perfect time of year because I'm in California, in Northern California, and it's like 70 degree days. Uh, it gets you 50s at night, so it's not a huge temperature swing. It should be perfect. But, uh, you know, so for most plants, it works great. Can, can, right. can, can, I, can, I, can I jump in there with an appropriate question for the two of you that came in? Um, sure. Let me just cue it up. Uh, give me one second. So let me make that bigger. Outdoor drones. So this is one of the topics we're going to have on the show today with Rick. Is it too late to grow your seeds outdoors? And you're doing auto flower as well. So let's talk a little bit about planting season. You know, I know a lot of people secure their seeds in January, but it's it's really dependent on where you live. I think that's uh, yeah, exactly, uh, James. And uh, it's interesting because. Uh, one thing that I learned about growing outdoors years ago, I, I went to visit uh, Breeder Steve in Switzerland uh, when he was in Lugano. Um, and uh, I went to help him harvest. And uh, it was interesting because Steve said they had just put these plants out by the end of July. And uh, it was late September. I was there and we were going to start harvesting. These plants were a good six feet tall, big, round uh, six foot wide bushes with just these massive coals on them. And um, he, Steven said they put them out. Probably they were like a foot or two clones outdoors by the end of July. And they still grew out to be six foot, you know, tall and wide bushes that needed to be staked with big wood um like one by twos in order to hold these massive uh, uh, bushes up. But if you can do that, um, you can definitely do that uh, here in the Midwest. And so, um, you know, especially with autos, autos, you know, most of them, a lot of them are 70 days, 75, um, 80 days. But, uh, you know, um, you can still do, do them here. You can do them really all across the country, you know, outdoors. And uh, there's a lot of um, commercial growers that are uh, switching to feminized auto flowers outdoors um, because they finish so quickly. Um, and it's, uh, um, you know, the quantity uh, and they still get a really good yield, very easy to, uh, uh, to finish in a short amount of time. Awesome. Okay, can you read that? You want to talk about your line of auto flowers? Sorry. Well, uh, the white line uh, of autos are uh, doing really well. Um, we get so much positive feedback on them. Um, the uh, I think it's really about the selection. Uh, in working with a very close friend on these uh, auto flowers that uh, 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 they have produced. And, uh, you know, we, we white label them and uh, they're doing exceedingly well. Um, you know, people like the ease and especially for a lot of new growers, they're coming to the market. They like um, the fact that they're feminized. So you don't have to, you know, call any males and, you know, in states where they have a limit of uh, flowered plants uh, that uh, helps them adhere, adhere to the, the regulation. Um, and uh, also, you know, something that's going to finish that quickly, 70 days, 
you know, start to finish. I think that's, uh, that's tremendous. Um, and so they can actually see um, the finishing uh, of plants on an accelerated basis. You know, Jeff Lohenfels, uh, who wrote the book, Do It Yourself, uh, Auto Flowers, um, he's also the, the author of the Teeming With Books, uh, he says that uh, uh, autoflowers are uh, the modern tomato. The reason for this is that um, very seldom does something that's uh, revolutionary like a tomato or an autoflower um, come along. And uh, what makes uh, these autoflowers so different is the fact that, um, you know, they have ruderalis and so they will... Uh, flower um, on something different than just photo period. Um, and so like uh, a lot of you know, is autoflowers are uh, flowered out uh, by the taproot once that bottoms out. Tapology, I think somebody called it, which uh, I thought was pretty uh, uh, kind of cool. Um, and uh, so that's what triggers it. So um tremendous uh, results now with a lot of breeding uh, happening at uh, a much higher level. A botanist, um, like in California, have worked on many strains to really improve them um, and have really made a huge difference in the quality of the, uh, the uh, autoflower uh, cultivars. So, James, you're on. Oh, there you are. <laughs> My laptop just died. It wasn't plugged into the wall. It was plugged into the <laughs> plugged into the laptop, but the laptop wasn't plugged into the wall. So go figure. But yeah, we're back. Not sure how much of that you heard, but uh, yeah, yeah, autoflowers are just a, a tremendous, uh, really great for for uh, new growers. Yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, it's funny because sometimes established growers, guys that have been growing cannabis have problems growing autos because they want to treat it like a can like a regular photo period cannabis plant and you need to treat it like an auto flower. You know, I, I do some breeding large scale. I do uh, bulk seed sales as well. And so some of the guys that uh, I work with are, you know, the best ones are actually tomato farmers, you know, because, uh, you know, row crop farmers tend to treat them all the same. And they, you know, it's not that they don't need a lot of love, but they don't need the same amount of attention that, that you need for a traditional cannabis plant photo period. Um, so the guys that can do them like, you know, at, at scale, the guys that are the best are the tomato farmers. Um, so yeah, let's see. We got all kinds of stuff in the chat here. James just came yeah, back. Hold on. I, I was trying. There was a, a relevant question. Uh, now I just lost it. I had it up for a second. You know, I think I, someone, I'll just go uh, until you can find it. But someone says Fems and Autos, what a drag. I think there's great things with Fems and Autos, just like there is. I don't think anything should be overlooked. I think that regular seeds are amazing. Uh, working with regular seeds are great if you want to do it. I think. There's advantages to working with fens. There's advantages to working with autos, and not everything is for everybody. And you know, I wouldn't knock one or the other. Uh, you want to repeat the question there? How do you select auto flowers for breeding? What upcoming quality auto flower breeders would you recommend? Uh, man, I would say Mosca. Yeah, I'd recommend Mosca. But as far as for selections. For, for myself, how I do selections is uh, I look for, you know, so, so basically with auto flowers, if you're breeding an auto and a photo, you've got to breed them together. And then you got to go back three, four generations before you can really sell that auto flower seed. And each generation you're breeding and looking for something specific. Uh, and sometimes those projects can go in different directions. You can find multiple things and breed towards those goals. But what I'm looking for is structure. But first and foremost, it's always terpene profile. You know, if you're working with a big enough progeny of plants, you're selecting because you don't get to keep your mother alive. So you're really looking for something that has an amazing chirp pro profile first. So you're looking for that nose. And then you start going for structure, finishing time, uh, obviously bug resistance and all that stuff. Like if you have problems, you, you know, I stress test my plants as well. So stress testing is important. And then 
growing those out, you know, you're, you're going through multiple generations and also testing each one out. So the stuff takes years to actually do correctly. Um, but as far as becoming breeders that are doing, I think Mandalorian's got some really cool stuff. I think Mosca's got some good stuff. Of course, Mephisto, they're the OGs of the industry. You know, um, there's tons of guys. Uh, Daz, Night Owl is doing some really good work as well. Yeah, so there's lots of uh, there's lots of interesting choices, and people are really pushing the limit on what you can do with autos. They've gotten to a place where I never thought they would 10 years ago, or more than that now, but 10 years ago when I saw them in Europe, I was really disappointed with auto flowers that I'd never worked with them. I, you guys have probably heard the story a million times from me, but, you know, I, I just keep getting – you know, year by year, more impressed by the direction auto flowers have gone in and the quality product that it produces. You know, I think we're, we're getting stuff that's, you know, finishing in 55 to 60 days when it's optimal. I see, you know, some of my stuff is testing above 30% THC, which I never in my life would have thought possible that a plant from an auto flower could test that high. Uh, terpenes are, you know, 5% which uh, I, I think is amazing. And this is under HPS lighting. So that's a little bit different than outdoor, but still, you know, I feel like we can get there uh, as a whole. And, you know, there's more and more people getting into it, better breeders getting into it. I just, I think, you know, if you, if you didn't like auto flowers in the past and you grew them out, I think now is the time to give them another try. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, the auto flowers from like the low rider days, uh, they're so different now. Um, yeah. and I think really the knowledge of how to grow them properly too has helped significantly, you know, because not only advancements in the breeding side of it, but also the, the, the level of uh, growers, you know, um, the Windy City um, Autos here, uh, he did some really fine work uh, here locally. And, um, you know, he's experimented with different types of feeding regimens, really pushing the plants eating wise, you know, use the nectar four shot soil uh, with some teas, some instant teas, uh, like from Culture Biologics. Uh, we've had tremendous success with those um, and, uh, you know, supplementing with the, uh, the nectar calcium products, um, botanic sassin. Uh, someone who I work with has uh, put together some really, really smart recipes um, and, uh, you know, really kind of pushing what uh, the plants can absorb because, you know, with with auto flowers are growing so quickly that you want to make sure that the soil has the nutrients for bloom before they actually need it. And so when you supercharge that soil, um, the plants are, you know, able to absorb it. And so, um, you know, trying to do uh, some organic methods with some really, or really strong organic, um, easily to uptake uh, nutrients is really key to, uh, you know, be having some really successful autoflower pros. At least what we're finding. Yeah, outdoors, I'm a big fan, of, and indoors, of soil and amended soil and not using salts if possible. But, you know, for breeding, I, I use cocoa. Um, I've been working with a company called Veg Bloom. You guys have probably heard of them. We're working on some recipes for specifically for autos and potentially for breeding, I think is another one that I've been working on their recipes. Uh, they've, they've done some experiments as well with the autos. And, but yeah, I feel like if we go back to those like low rider and, you know, early girl, especially early girl genetics, it's funny because uh, I've gotten some of those seeds and grown them out and it's definitely the genetics that the problem lies within the genetics and the further away we get from those things, you know, capturing the trait, that autoflower trait, but also going back, uh, someone says magic melon is fire. Magic melon is okay. In my opinion, magic melon has a tendency to, uh, shoot out intersexual traits. Um, you know, it's like I was working on some magic melon projects and, you know, I'm working on a 45 day cultivar right now that uh photo period cultivar and we're going to potentially work on that with autos as well but right now we're just uh doing some selfing projects with it and seeing if we can produce something that selfs hmm. 
Speak on the duration of auto seeds versus photo. Uh, the, the seeds, as far as the duration of how long the seeds will last, if you store them correctly, they should last a really long time. How do you store your food? How about that? You know what, uh, James, I, I do things a little bit differently. So uh, I will take the, um, like the six by 10 uh, manila envelopes and we'll put uh, seeds in those, have them labeled and marked so that way we know what they are, obviously, and a little history on them. Um, and then we'll put them in the refrigerator between like uh, 55, uh, 58 degrees. Um, and uh, uh, we'll try to keep them in like plastic shoe boxes, just sitting in there lined up uh, on a bed of uh, rice. So, um, and as you know, uh, rice will act as a desiccant in case there's any moisture. Um, but that seems to preserve our seeds very well, uh, and especially with um, uh, botany class, uh, I had learned uh, about, um, you know, seeds, some strains of, some types of seeds need cold in order for them to uh, properly germinate the following year. And so, you know, using that and keeping that in mind, that's why I moved to a refrigerator. And, um, you know, folks always say that our strains uh, germinate very quickly, you know, faster than a lot of other strains. And uh, I kind of attribute to that to, you know, properly storing them uh, in the refrigerator, give them a little cold, um, and then, um, you know, they come out of hibernation and germinate as soon as they get that moisture and heat. So, yeah, stratification is amazing. My buddy Nick told me about stratification a couple of years ago. And, you know, if you have really fresh seeds, the best thing to do is put them in the freezer overnight before you germinate them. That's a good little trick. Uh, you know, for me, we got some seeds right here. I have desiccants. These are fresh seeds. So as you guys can see, we got seeds with desiccants. Um, I store them in these bins uh, to make sure that they're, they're fully dry because the last thing you want to do is put moist or wet seeds, seeds that have any moisture content in the refrigerator. Uh, you will take your germination rate down from 100% to potentially 50 or below. And that happened with a good friend of mine. So do not refrigerate your seeds till they are fully dry and fully cured. And they could feel dry, they could feel cured, but uh, you know, great way to ruin your uh, amazing crop that you get all excited about. And you know, people get in big fights and you know, long-term enemies over that kind of stuff. It's really sad. Yeah, you can't rush the process. You know, the seeds, they're, they're ready when they're ready. and uh, Always, it never hurts to wait an extra week or two. For sure. Yeah. So, you can buy a huge amount of those desk packs on Zon cheap, and they are rechargeable. Just microwave them. Yeah. Do Do you see that question on the screen? Um. You know what? I don't. You're not going to see more regular auto seeds from me. I'm not doing regular auto seeds. I only do feminized. Uh, you can't keep the mother alive. There's there's a lot of reasons, but it's easier. Uh, you know, when I'm doing smaller, I might use someone's uh, regular, and then I'll breed I'll breed it into a feminized line right away. Um, you know, there are advantages maybe as far as genetic stability. People will talk, but a lot of what we think of as genetic stability, uh, you know, that's something that can be bred in or out of a plant. So I think a lot of people are like, oh, man, hermaphrodites, you know, you get hermaphrodites with feminized seeds. You get hermaphrodites with regular seeds. And, you know, inbreeding plants that have those traits is going to cause more of it. So regular seeds, I think regular autos, that's nothing I'm going to be working on. But, uh, you know, I'm sure I think Mandalorian has regular autos. And there are a bunch of people with regular autos out there. So 20 hours of light, 4 hours of dark is optimal for autos indoors. Or outdoors, if you're in a place that has 20 hours of light outdoors, that would be ideal. The more light you give those plants, the better. Uh, target PPM or EC just depends. Uh, like 2.25 is great. Depend it's depending on the cultivar uh, and depending on what you're using because I feel like that can be all over the place when you're talking about it's, it's target EC, something like that. 
which is that's what 1250 uh, and it depends you know it's, it's so dependent on the the products you're using and you know there's there's so many things it depends on what do you think about that? Yeah, no, no, I think uh, that's it's pretty spot on. You know, as far as the, the number of hours, you know, 20, 24, um, a lot of people say, um, you know, I think 18.6 also is a good alternative because we all know that the plants regenerate, you know, they actually get stronger at night, so they need some darkness. Um, so, you know, try both. See what works best for you. Which which uh, outcome you like better? Only but, uh, <laughs> That's well, in my opinion. The thing is, is I've done side by side, and in my opinion, I think the twenty hours of light with four hours of darkness is ideal for autos. Uh, it was it was the difference of like almost uh, almost twenty percent on the yield. So that's with side by side in the same exact environment, growing the same cultivar. You know, and there, there's other variables that could have affected it potentially, but I feel like I feel strongly that that 20 hours of light is more significant. Um, so that's just my take on it. But yeah, I have a lot of well, it's too expensive, and it's like, well, if it's too expensive, do 18. You can do 12. You're just not going to get as full of bud. I mean, I feel like the the buds don't fill out quite as much on 12. You notice a significant difference on that 20 hours of light indoor. I mean, it looks just as good as any other, you know, it doesn't look like autoflower in my opinion. Mm, yeah. Yeah. How many, how many cultivars though? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, so someone, oh, you can answer that. And then someone, uh, if you want to get the soul seeker question, We'll answer that next, uh, Peter, about silver. The alien wedding, uh, keeper or the unicorn pheno. You know what? Honestly, to me, I think it's which is your favorite plant. You know, do the selection, pop the whole pack, and uh, you know our, our packs come twelve seeds uh, to a pack. So on average, you'll get six females do your selection on those females and which one you like best because, you know, we like to say there's a keeper in every pack and, uh, you know, some people there's multiple keepers and find out which one you like best because, you know, yes, um, as a breeder, you know, I have an ideal, but what's best for you, my ideal may be different than the growers. So, you know, what, what is it, which is the mom that may, is most special to you is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It was most subjective what people like, I think, for the most part. And depending on your environment, one cultivar could be different than another. You know, as far as even within a progeny, you can have one that's going to grow better in one environment than another. Um, yeah. So, yeah, and I think, you know, one of the other things to mention is, uh, you know, to make the plant fully expressed, that's how you're going to be able to tell what the best version of that, that cross is. You know, I think a lot of people are, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about a lot of growers, but I think a lot of people are mediocre when it comes to growing uh, and they're not making the plants express. So to a degree, it doesn't matter to, to a lot of people, unfortunately. I think people really yeah. need to pick up their game when they're doing pheno selections. And that's, that's what makes a big difference with some of the best. I saw Karma Genetics. It looks like Karma's on here. But guys like Karma where, like, he knows how to make the plant express. That guy got gas into his seed lines, you know, before anybody that really pushed a whole, whole bunch of gas. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's all about making your plants express. Uh, Rick, I think you're muted. Oh, okay. What was that that you were saying? Oh, yeah, now yeah, you're yeah. on mute. Uh, uh, Karma, he is a master at uh, making his plants express themselves. Man, just uh, that guy just produces fire. He's a good... Uh, Good friend and uh, definitely someone to look up to. Totally. Yeah, he's all about that gas. You know, it's a, you know, and then sour. I think, you know, sour is something that, I, you know, there's a handful of people that have worked with sour. I was doing the sour BX. I think originally I was the first one back in. We were releasing 
seeds in 2010, 2011 of our sour, our original lab was a sour cross and then the back cross. Um, but it's like sour is a tricky plant to work with. You got to be patient. Uh, and we're, you know, I feel like the traits that you're looking for are elusive. So you really need somebody who knows how to grow to get them express to express properly so you can find those traits, you know, and that's, that's the difference between, the guys that are just, you know, making seeds and the guys that are really putting in the work and really making, you know, amazing seeds. I feel like it's all about getting that expression so you can do a proper pheno hunt. Because if you can't make them express, you can't do a proper pheno hunt. Yeah, exactly. And it's really about, you know, finding uh, the plants that really match up to what you think is superior uh, selection or superior female, male to work with. Um, because, you know, um, it's that hunt uh, that really leads you to those plants that will help you um, deliver, you know, the, the cultivar, the offspring that you're trying to share with uh, the growers who are growing your seeds. And I think that's really key because, you know, the, the, the greater success they have, uh, I think that's the great, greatest success that we could have. Definitely. Yeah, so let's touch on some. We got a bunch of questions in the chat, which I love. Uh, Do you see you that know, one? How does heavy feeding affect full expression? Um, I feel like you go lighter feeding if you want full expression. If you want bigger yields, you use heavy feeding. Um, but, you know, that's, again, that's individual. You know, what I consider light feeding is what, you know, it, it might be the opposite with people. So it's, a, it's such an individual thing. There's, you know, 70 days in the life of that plant, and there's so many different feeding regimens and things you can do to make it expressed differently, and you can be successful on several different levels. So the best thing for, you know, guys that are just starting out is, you know, follow one person's recipe, continue with that instead of taking advice from 20 different people which happens all the time. You know, you go in and you hear, oh, I need to add this, I need to add that. Man, I would start off with something super basic and just follow a recipe off the bottles if I was starting over, you know, if that, if that was me. Um, I don't even know how we led into that. But <laughs> Well, you know what, it's funny that uh, it's true. I, I think going lighter, you'll get a, a better expression of the plant um, because you're avoiding a lot of issues you know, toxicity or feeding, which is never a good thing for plants. Um, and um, I think by by feeding light, I tend generally or uh, think of uh, half of what the manufacturer is recommending, uh, half to three quarter. Um, but uh, and, and and is talking about heavy feeding can be detriment to pure kids. It is very, very cultivar specific. So, you, you know, it's like saying one thing, it's like saying blue dream, it's, it's not going to express as well as if you feed it heavy. I will tell you that as a fact. I feel like blue dream, you can just keep feeding it and feeding it and feeding it. You can bump that EC up really high and it'll take it and it's going to express better. Uh, thank you, Mr. Toad. 100% correct on that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very cultivar specific. And I think a lot of people have lost the factor or are missing the cue on the fact that you need to learn how to treat each cultivar and feed each cultivar differently. You can't grow a room of 15 plants and expect them all to be optimal. It's just not going to happen. You know, especially if you're doing a drip irrigation, if you're hand feeding and you're adjusting, you know, each plant to give it exactly what it needs. That's one thing. But, uh, you know, these cultivars all require different things and some of them might need more nitrogen you know, going into flower and some of them need less. And then, you know, we got real finicky plants that they have to have the perfect balance. You know, I think if you look at a you know, good OG, good OG, it's one of the most difficult plants to grow successfully and get a good harvest every time. Uh, you know, I had Master Yoda on my show a while back. He grows killer OG. And it's like, the one thing with OG is it's finicky. You give it too much, it doesn't like it. You don't give it enough. It piss, you get pissed off at the plant. It gets pissed off at you. It's just, it's a tough thing to dial in. But once you dial it in, you get amazing flower. You look at Josh D and the stuff Josh is doing, uh, you know, coming full circle with karma. And then we got Josh. 
Josh and his OGs, man, he's really dialed in OGs over the years to get them to express to their full potential all the time. So, and he has, you know, greenhouses full of OGs and it, it's all amazing. So. Yeah, very true. Yep. So yeah, something, there's something about NPK. It's NPK, but it's also, you know, it's also calcium, magnesium, and all the micros. It's not just one thing and NPK dialing that in obviously is super important, but some plants need more calcium and magnesium than others. And, you know, as a breeder, I, I'll put 12 varieties in a room and I have to find something that works, you know, for everything when I'm making seeds, you know, and that's the difficult part, um, you know, and then trying to adjust stuff by hand, it's really difficult. So yeah, let's see. We got so many good questions, guys. Hey, so James, on, on top of that, um, not only the, uh, uh, you know, the major uh, nutrients and uh, some of the minor ones, but then also the trace and micronutrients, I think are very key as well. You know, we use green aminos from uh, Green Grow Biologicals, and that's just superior. It has two types of seaweeds in it, uh, as well as um, some uh, um, crustacean shells, just really, really, plants love it. Uh, we use fish shit. Um, as well. Um, and then we use uh, uh, a couple different types of, of mycos uh, because I think the mycorrhizae uh, are really, really uh, beneficial and you know, kind of a pun there. But uh, um, it, it's true because we'll, we'll do it at, uh, um, at transplant um, and then we'll water it in with um, our once a week teas and we'll go super heavy. Uh, on the mycos and the plants, you know, within an hour or two are praying. Those leaves are just loving, you know, that, uh, that once a week uh, feeding. So yeah. definitely worth the time and investment to, to do that. Yeah. I used hum tea for years. Used to make it with Alaskan hummus. Used to do the hum tea and, uh, you know, make it with, take my wife's nylons and make tea in a five gallon bucket with a bubbler. Good stuff. Um, the, yeah, there's, and there, again, there's so many different approaches. You know, you find something and you slowly dial it in and Mammoth P and Recharge are fun to use. Somebody said that that's great. I think all these things. Yeah, and so, someone's yeah. rocking the Mammoth hat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that's right. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. And so now let's talk about breeding for a little bit with your uh, feed regimen. I tend to go with a little more, if mine's higher through with nitrogen throughout. And then, so typically on a 70 day cultivar, I'll bring that cultivar if I'm making seeds, you know, where I'm basically putting my donors in it, like the three and a half, four week point, I'll take those for a full hundred days in flower, which is long past the typical life cycle of that plant. So I'll give it nitrogen. And I basically uh, use this green stone powdered fish product and I'll spray. It's the worst thing indoors. Everybody hates it. Luckily. I'm not growing in my house, but my wife would kill me. But uh, I basically take the fish. It's basically a, you know, a, a tie in nitrogen. I take it and I spray it. It gets sprayed every – the plants get sprayed really light mist every couple of days, and it keeps them really green for another 30 days. And you can tell when they start to yellow naturally that that's when the seeds are done. So do you, what kind of tricks do you use for getting your go a little bit longer? Yeah, well, you know, uh, one thing is using a larger container for the moms. You know, typically, you know, I used to use a three to five. Yeah, honestly, I, I like a six or seven gallon container because I find that they will grow uh, larger and produce more um, more seeds, more keens. But uh, so that is, is one thing that really helps. But then also uh, kind of like what you said, uh, keeping more of the full strength nutrient longer in the flowering cycle and not to rush them. You know, a lot of times uh, cultivars are, you know, um, um, seven, eight week cultivars, um, taking them 10, 12 weeks uh, with full strength nutrient, keeping them greened up so they can produce more healthier uh, seeds. Um, and then also, 
uh, what we've done is we've bred underneath LED lights. Next light uh, is all we use. And, um, you know, the, the plants just have done very well underneath those. Uh, several years ago, when I first started using the next lights, uh, I compared the megas versus uh, the high pressure sodiums um, and uh, the 600s that we use and thousands. And they didn't skip a beat. I mean, they did, they produced a higher quality seed to where we had less white immature seeds. Yeah. And so the, the total overall seed count was higher under the, the next light megas. So, um, yeah, that, that's all we use right now. Yeah, it's real interesting. I've been experimenting with spectrum and having, you know, I had problems with my LEDs jumping into the Fluence TIs for my breeding project on a, a big one. And, uh, you know, adding some red spectrum in there with your LEDs is a great thing. HPS, though, for reversals is key. Um, I'm a huge fan. So, yeah. Well, let's see. We had a, uh, let me just queue up. This is from a while ago uh, from Chad Westport. Uh, let me make that a little bigger. But you can read that, right? Whoops. Um, my selection of the Cinderella 99 was from Original Brothers Grimstock. I went to, through five different families. I used Wally Ducks. I used some Egypsies. Uh, F2s of the Brothers Grimm, um, uh, but overall five different families. And I did my selection on those males and females that I liked the best, the ones that were closest to the pineapple pheno of the Cinderella 99, which is what uh, to me was more of the unicorn versus the uh, grapefruit um, pheno that you know most people would get out of the Cinderella 99. So I bred for that pineapple. Um, so I did not do the, the P1 selections like, um, you know, the Brothers Grimm did. I did it uh, mainly off of uh, the parental stock that I found uh, from Brothers Grimm, Wally Duck, Gypsy Nirvana, and, and a couple others. So, um, but, and then I worked with those males and females that uh, were more like the pineapple. So stem rub on a male or one that uh, was um, built uh, very similar in structure to the females is something that I look for and uh, did back then. And so now um, with my Cinderella, um, we, it is the pineapple selection that uh, you know, I bred over the years. Awesome. That's great, man. So, uh, yeah, are you smoking today, Rick? How's it going? Uh, not yet, but uh, I got the peak. So you know what? I got my I got the peak too right here. You know, but okay. I, you know, so was this scripted? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> tell you what, uh, you know, it's funny because I know James likes to takes to toke it up while uh, he's on the show. So I came prepared, Peter. So today, what I wanted to show you guys was, uh, you know, I've switched away from my peak. I love my peak, Rick. Love the peak. I've been using it pretty hard for the last couple of years. But I got this rig, and somebody got me to go back. I can't even remember who it was, but OG Steve, my buddy, got me on cold start dabs. And somebody the other day said, man, cold start dabs are really the way to go. They taste way better than the Puffco. And I said, no way, because I've been smoking the Puffco for you know years. But uh, I went back to the cold start, and now I'm, I'm hooked again on the cold start. I got some of uh, the bird extract right here. We've got some live rosin lemonhead Skittles. And how the cold start, if you guys don't know a lot about cold start, you get a really good chirp hit off it. So you take your... And why, actually, can you, can you angle your camera down slightly? I can. Let's see. I want to drop my rig. So we know, it's like when I talk to my dad on FaceTime and I only get his, his forehead and above. Yeah. So we're going to take and put that <laughs> extract in there cold. And then what we're going to do is we're going to heat this up with the torch. Just like that for about four or five seconds, you're gonna see just a tiny little bit of smoke. Yep, 
you guys don't even see me blowing out smoke, I bet. But it's terp overload. And that's one of the things I loved about the peak. But this is even stronger of a terp terpene profile. You don't hit enough, you, or you don't get enough of a hit. You just see that for a couple more seconds. And you can see the extract bubble there. And, and this is much better. Like, I used to do really hot dabs. And much better in your throat smoking it this way. <coughs> I really enjoy smoking it with the, you know, especially at night. I feel like the difference with dabs as opposed to flour for me, I feel like extract, you know, I like both. I love big joints. I, that's what I, my go-to is smoking joints. But I would say that dabs are really uh, clear. They, 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 I get a clear high from doing extract. Smoking extract gives me more of a clean, crisp high. And I would say that smoking joints makes me more relaxed. Uh, and that's cultivar dependent too, though, because I can smoke some haze and I'll be all wired up if I smoke a joint, heart palpitations and everything. Um, but yeah, it's just cold start dabs, man. I love it. You guys, if you're not doing cold start dabs, I hope you get a rig and you start doing them. Um, it's fantastic. You can't go wrong. And it actually makes your, it go, go a lot further. You know, you, so you start with the terpenes. You don't get as high doing the cold start. You just got to do a lot more of them. Looks like no smoke is coming out, I think, on the screen. But, yeah, I'm getting amazing taste, guys. Real skittily delicious. Okay, over to our other dab correspondent, Rick, in Illinois. Please tell oh. us about the other dab. Okay, so this is what I'm enjoying right now. This is a Terra Petra, the rosin that uh, a friend uh, had uh, put together for me. And uh, Terra Petra is one of our feminized the seeds. Um, and uh, we're going to heat up the Peak Pro here to kind of get this thing. Oh, there we go. So these pros are great. They're Bluetooth and uh, they're so convenient. But yeah, the uh, much better than the last version. So smooth. Wow. Yeah, no, that's uh, <coughs> definitely <coughs> nice punch. So this is what I'm working on. I got some Acapulco gold right here. These are some Acapulco gold seed. I don't know if you can tell the size of these seeds are humongous. Uh, as opposed to these tiny seeds right here, it's, it might be a little hard for you guys to tell. But these are like double size seeds, these Acapulco golds. And uh, we're doing some phenol hunts with them right now. Uh, they are, I think they weigh 0 0.03 as opposed to like 0 0.017. So literally almost double the size. And so I'm working with some uh, Acapulco. We got some Oaxacan, some Mexican stuff, and then uh, got some interesting Colombian varieties that we're going to be working with really soon. So are you working yeah, with flowering time on those? Have you finished any of them yet? Oh, no. I'm sure the flowering time is going to be uh, quite a bit longer, but that's okay. So we're pollinating as well. So we're going to be pollinating branches and see what we get. And then, you know, one thing I've been doing that if you guys are breeding and you want to get scientific with it and uh, don't want to spend too much money, but you want to, you know, terpene profile and cannabinoid profile, the best way to do it is to pollinate branches and then have plant materials saved uh, so you can test that plant material. Now, if you're talking about sequencing, you can save that plant material for a long time with those seeds. Uh, so if you don't have the money right now, you can do it down the road. But make sure to save a little bit of plant material when you do your breeding projects. I think it's a great idea. Justin, definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah, so anything else from the chat, Peter? Uh, well, I just want to say, because I know you're into uh, your your MMA, James, I've been training. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm about to start training, but I got the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> see that. Oh, wait, what is it? Are you on clubs? Long pipes. <laughs> Peter, long pipes? <laughs> Is 
That's yeah. uh, from Onyx. Love it, love it. Yeah, it's funny because I got in my office. I got my winning boxing gloves, so we'll have to box on one of these shows, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I, I, I thought it'd be cool to do like an FCP charity uh, boxing. I mean, maybe like in a couple, maybe end of summer, early fall, SoCal, NorCal. <laughs> yeah. We'll find a venue and get a whole bunch of, it, it's like the, I want to do the FCP golf invitational and it like doesn't matter how good or bad you are at golf. Like, I think we should be fun. blindfolded, blindfolded boxing. <laughs> we're tag team boxing i don't know what to do but uh yeah so we had uh and by the way you you guys are uh uh i think rick should give away some seeds but we need to think of a good trivia question I think so too. I'll give away. Um, so I always go in the sports direction and Boston sports, and people who don't watch sports hate that. So are are there? If you guys can off the cuff think of a good like breeding trivia question, and I guess we gotta we we need we need to implement like a uh, Rick. Let me just mute you because I'm getting the feedback. But we need to implement like a. Uh, because whenever we have to monitor the chat to see who answers first and then someone complains that they answered first, like a split second ahead of someone else, and we get the headache of having to deal with that. But uh, Yeah, it was tough. I had to give away seats to people that didn't win because I wasn't sure. So I gave away, just so you guys know, I gave seats to everybody. So it's going to, you know, if right. we do, we're doing one trivia question from now this on. This is like modern day little kids where everyone's a winner. Yeah. No, no. I, have, I have a question that uh, I think should be pretty simple to to okay. answer. So, so, so is it is this like a first person to answer correctly question? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So let me look at and everybody in the chat can help verify who answered first. Here we go. Okay. So James has a pre preferred uh, number of hours of daylight versus night. What is that time frame that he prefers for feminized autoflowers? They got too strong. No, there, there. Oh God! Did you see it? Yep, we got about fifty of them. Now we got to see if we find the top one. Someone said nine. Was 20 correct? Because they're about four. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, man, uh, right. man, it looks like he was the first one, unless you guys see. Can man Dan. <laughs> okay. So do we all, does, does anybody in the chat dispute can man Dan uh, answering first? Oh, no, he did. I could see it right here, Peter. I, 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 I agree with you, but sometimes uh, that's not good enough for people. Yeah. All right. We have a quorum. Can Man Dan is the one. Okay. Perfect. All right. Uh, We're going to give him a, a pack of uh, Mountain Dew Baja Blast. So, yeah. I, mean, I, uh, I have seeds available on Love and also on seeds here now officially. So... I'm going to give away a gift certificate to get seeds from Seeds Here Now and a gift certificate to get seeds from Love. So you're going to get a gift certificate in the mail rather than seeds, and then you can get with that gift certificate, there'll be a code where you can order uh, any of my seeds for free, one time. Two and, by, and by mail, we mean via email. Like, we we, we yeah. can do that digitally. We can make that happen without <laughs> having to send out a physical gift certificate. Uh, all right. So, uh, but you need you need a you need we a need question. a winner. So we need a question. Does that do either of you have a good question? I think we're gonna give Peter the question. Yeah, right. give. I, I have to think of a question. This may have to be a cannabis question. How about that? Yeah. Di by the way, I. Uh, I wish I had it queued up, but uh, someone, 
in, in the all of us get shade uh, thrown our way, I got a uh, why does James Loud do that show with Peter? He knows nothing about Canada. <laughs> I was like, thanks, brother. Uh, <laughs> no, they were talking about me, Peter. <laughs> That's. Yeah, we all, and, and then like like uh, at 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 Canicon, Oklahoma, like someone was like, "Fuck Brandon Rust." I'm like, "Fucking it!" Like everyone hates someone. Uh, no matter what. Yeah, uh, smoke some weed and. Uh, yeah. All right, so can I do a Boston sports? Yes, Boston sports. Yep. Yeah. I don't, I don't like Boston sports, but you can do a Boston sports. I'm, yeah, I'm, you can M MFK. You can troll Jim Belushi all you want. I I I, I was biting my. T See, this is like I need to be nice, but uh, yeah, J Jim Belushi came on. Ye what was today? Sunday on Friday, and uh, I was joking that he he never saw a camera and a microphone that <laughs> that, he, that he didn't want to cozy up to. Uh, they didn't want to sidle up to, but um. Uh, I hear Gemma yelling my name, but uh, all right. So um, in in uh, since I've been watching the Bruins advance to the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Okay, baby girl, come here. So uh, there was a Bruins hockey player. Um, who is going to be amazing, who uh, was paralyzed. So what was his name? And what are they winning? Uh, the gift certificate, right? Gift certificate. You got two and by the way, all of you guys are, the, Gemma's calling my name because all of you are standing between me and that big juicy brisket that you see right there. Nice. So as soon as we wrap this up, no, not not college hockey, Bruins. Uh, oh God! Is we got any? <laughs> we got Gretzky and Bobby Orr. Not yeah. Patrice Bergeron, Cheddar Bob. Uh, I got to scroll. I don't even know of anyone. Uh... Okay, let's let's do a weed question, then we'll cut yeah, it. Yeah, there we go. We're going to cut it, and uh, I want to know three types of products and uh, or compounds that you can reverse female plants with to make them male. I'll give you guys a hint. The first one, we'll use uh, colloidal silver. Yeah, and people appreciate Grateful Dead questions, which uh, we can keep for <laughs> trivia. We do. <clears throat> what do we got? So, STS, Coil Silver, GBA, Silver. Oh, yeah, we got a lot of good guys. Okay. NPK, no, that's not it. STSPS fertilization, that's going to have to work, uh, but that's not a compound. So the yeah, you said compound, yeah. So if we can, guys, I have two SCS. I don't know what what's SCS. You know, in copper, no, silver nitrate, silver uh, sulfate, colloidal silver. I'll accept that. Silver, silver, silver. There's nano silver, which is also colloidal. I mean, it's, it's a true silver. But silver thiosulfate, silver nitrate. Uh, GB GA3 is a uh, GA3 is also acceptable, and that would be uh, let's see. So lock RODG was the first one, and. Carmen uh, Gustafson with GA3 STS and Coil Silver. I'm going to give it to both of you guys. We have a ringer too. Cobalt, Cobalt Silver and GA3. It was was Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Toad? Was he before that? No, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, so by by the way, there was someone who got my question right. Uh, Did someone get your uh, question? Johnny Johnny HB, you can hit me up, uh, and we'll get you something too. 
We'll get you a gift certificate as well. It was Norm Levier. So, uh, sorry, my, Rick, you were, you were muted. Oh, okay. No, I was just saying, let's uh, let's throw him a pack of seeds as well. It will do pink lemonade. Nice. Okay, guys, so if you are raw, raw, R-O-D-G, is that like raw dog? Lock raw dog? And uh, Carmen Gustafson, you guys email me. Uh, if you can screenshot your answer on those two and email me, jameslogenetics at gmail.com, I will take care of you. Um, so, yeah, and then – don't, and by the way, don't get angry at me if it takes longer than a couple weeks for James to get those packs out to you. Yeah, it, it might take <laughs> a little while. We have to actually make the feeds before we get them out. But uh, well, you know what? And then I should, guess I should give my email too, so yeah. these winners uh, can get their seeds. Uh, so it's Mosca at MoscaSeeds.com. Cool. Okay, and while those people are sending their emails, let's just all visualize what what I'm going to be hitting in ten minutes. <laughs> nice. So yeah, I don't know if you guys. Are, I've seen some stuff in the chat about joking about me getting in shape or whatever, you know. And I think I just wanted to touch on that real quick. It actually kind of ties in with Rick with ulcerative colitis something I've been battling for a long time. I was on uh, prednisone. I, I got what I believe to be COVID in March of last year and the medication I was taking wouldn't work anymore. And so I was on prednisone trying to figure it out all the way until uh, the end of April, I got my first infusion of Remicade. And so I got off prednisone shortly after that. And so I went from having this round face, which was from the prednisone to uh, starting to work out and get in shape and I'm feeling a lot better. My gut's healthy. Um, you know, I didn't want to go on Remicade. It, it suppresses your immune system. And, you know, with all the talk of COVID right now, and you know, I tried everything. I tried THCA, CBD. I had tinctures of both. I was trying different concentrations, different blends. And it came down to me having to go in monthly to get a blood infusion. And so it's not nearly as scary as I thought it was going to be. Uh, you know, it's it's a thing thing we learn, and you know, diet is important. Uh, you know, it's it's pretty amazing how you can take some of these modern drugs. I mean, Remicade is a, a biologic, and so it goes in and suppresses part of your immune system. Prednisone is the worst drug I've ever been on in my life. Uh, it's not something to look forward to. If there's any way to go off of prednisone, you got to get off it. Uh, Rick has also dealt with ulcerative colitis. So for, for a long time, right? And uh, yeah, it's definitely not, uh, not comfortable, but there's a lot of different types of therapies now. Um, there's a, a really good hospital here in Chicago, Northwestern, that is a teaching institution. So they do a lot of, uh, a lot of clinicals for different products, uh, such as Remicade, as I remember. Uh, my GI, who was the head of the department, uh, talked about it. Uh, he just felt that I wasn't the right candidate for that type of uh, medication. But, uh, uh, yeah, I've been on the same uh, med for, um, it's called 6MP, for like the last uh, 10 years. Um, and it just keeps everything in check. I've had no flare-ups, and it's, uh, gosh, it's been years. So, yeah, the good good thing to be able to find that therapy that works for you, um, because you know it can, it can have a, a significant effect on your life. Um, so yeah, it's best to treat it and you know stick to that therapy. Nice. Yeah. So someone said, can you recommend things to help with nausea? And I would say that uh, you know, for for me, nausea. You get the the indica seemed to work better for nausea for me personally. I, I use uh, really strong varieties, and you know I think I kept my colitis in remission for seven years without drugs, just from smoking cannabis. I can attribute that to smoking cannabis. And then you know as you get older, your body changes, and 
So now I'm on new treatments and, uh, and I feel really good about the stuff I'm on now. I can eat normal food again, which, you know, it's like you, you go on a clean diet and it's like, no matter what I did, I gained weight and I always look bloated for a year. So it's good to be back to some sort of normal to see, you know, now with COVID almost, you know, looking like COVID is in remission as well. Um, so yeah, but it, there, there, it, there, Rick, uh, hold on. You're muted. Go ahead. Oh, James, are you vaccinated? I am vaccinated, yes. Oh, okay. All right, good, good. What about you? Yes. Yep. I'm vaccinated. My, my wife made me get it immediately. She's uh, like seven months pregnant. You know, that's a whole other conversation for other stuff. We've gotten fights on the show about the whole vaccination thing with <laughs> someone and Ed Rosenthal. And you know, there's nothing wrong with you know, a vaccine. I think it's a personal choice. I'm all for medical freedom you want to get vaccinated you go get vaccinated you don't want to get vaccinated you have that choice that's we live in america you know you don't want to, you don't believe in vaccines you dislike it i i'm 100 percent in support of medical freedom those are the freedoms that we have um you know it's, it's a personal preference so so rick just yeah. there was one last quite uh breeding question for you do you see that one? Oh yeah 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 uh, yeah, the uh, uh, the cherry chem. Um, so the uh, it's actually not snow lotus. Um, it's actually uh, sunshine daydream um, crossed to an, a cherry Afghan, and that's from Bodhi. Um, yeah, that uh, that one is really special. It's the most cherry of anything that I'd smelled, and so I was really excited to to work with her. Um, and that, uh, that chem 91, um, was, um, uh, ideal because it, you know, it, she led so much gas to the offspring with that, uh, really nice cherry flavor. Um, people seem to like that. We gave it away, um, uh, for several years. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, a it's really, uh, a, a really fun one that, uh, to work with. Nice. Well, it's been a great show. My studio is going to be uh, set here, hopefully next week, maybe the week after. We're going to do another show next week, regardless. And then, uh, yeah, I'd like to invite you, Rick, to come out to California. Maybe on your Oregon trip, you can come out a couple days early, and we could film a James Loud episode because we're going to be filming it in advance, and then I'll be on the chat during the show. Um, so I kind of think we'll, we'll be able to do some different stuff. Um, you can do like a live premiere. Oh yeah. Yeah. I got some interesting guests that are going to be on the show. We got all kinds of cool Bay area people. I'd love to have you on the show, Rick, when we do it live or when we all do right. it from the studio. Peter, good chat with you guys. Thanks guys. So, uh, with that, just some housekeeping, uh, Mr. Toad, who's in the chat, uh, all your stuff was cleaned out <laughs> yesterday, so send more seeds down. James Loud, we're running out of some of your stuff, but I'll follow up with you on that. And hopefully Rick will bless us with uh, some of his genetics. Uh, and what's today? Sunday. And maybe tomorrow we'll pull together a... Uh, a uh, veterans round table. So I haven't planned it yet, but uh, we'll uh, maybe get uh, Doc Ray and some other veterans. Excellent. Yeah. Correct. Well, enjoy the Memorial Day weekend. Uh, don't forget what it's all about, people, and uh, people that died in the line uh, for, for their service. We appreciate you and everything you've done. Uh, I hope you guys all take a nice dab and enjoy this wonderful Sunday. Have a good one. Cheers. All right. Thanks, everyone.